we're going to be walking through an example here of how forward search and branch and bound work on a relatively simple problem. And then we're going to connect that to the actual code that we would use here. Okay, so just recall that for forward search, it determines the best action to take from an initial state S by looking at all of the possible transitions up to a depth or horizon D. And so the visualization here is showing a tree with three states and two actions to a depth of two. So the example here that we're gonna be using is this simple die rolling game, okay? And so what we're showing here is a six-sided die. The, the game we're gonna assume that we're using a three-sided die, okay? So this is just for visualization here. And so how this is going to work is at the start of the game, the die is going to be rolled for us, okay? So we're gonna roll the die here and now a one is showing on the face of the die. So we have two options here. We can either choose to keep this die right now. And if we choose to keep, we get paid in dollars, whatever number value is on the face of the die. Okay, so this would pay us $1 if we choose to keep the die. The other option is that we can re-roll the die. If we choose to re-roll the die, then we get no payment towards us that turn, but we have the option to make money in future turns. Okay, so it's a simple problem. We just have two options. We can either keep or roll. And in this example, we're going to assume that we have three turns total. So the game ends after three turns and there's no more options for us after that. Okay, so the goal here is to maximize the amount of money we can make on this die rolling game, given that we only have three turns to decide whether we want to keep or roll the die. So we're going to walk through this here of how forward search would sort of build up this problem. But first, we want to get some intuition here. Okay, so I think the simplest thing that we could do Given that we're in this starting state of having a one showing on the die with three turns left, what should we do? Okay, so if we choose to keep here every single turn, what would that look like? So if we choose to keep on the first turn, right, we're going to get a plus one bonus. And then if we choose to keep on the second turn and the third turn, and then all the way to the end of the game, right, we have three turns. So that's three keep actions that we're going to take. So for each of these keep actions, we're going to get paid $1, right? Every time we choose keep, we know that we're going to transition into a state where the die has not been re-rolled. So we're going to get $1 each time we take the keep action. Okay, now if instead at this last turn, if instead of choosing keep, we choose to re-roll the die here, then it would look like this, right? And now we know at that last turn, we're going to get zero payment because we chose to re-roll. And then the game is over after that. So we can already sort of have this intuition here that the optimal thing to do in that last turn is to always keep the die. You never want to re-roll because you're guaranteed to get $0 if you re-roll versus if you keep, you're guaranteed to get a payment in that last turn. Okay, so we already have that intuition now that in that last turn, given that we only have three turns here, we want to be keeping the die at that last turn. Okay, and so we can sort of look at how the tree would get built up now for other actions as well. So going back up now, when we have a one showing on the die with two turns left, here's what that looks like if we had chose to keep on the first action. And we can repeat this, right, and build up the entire search tree here. So the, the goal here now is to be able to compute the utilities of being in each one of these states, right? That's, that's the ultimate goal of how we're going to actually determine what is the best sequence of actions in this die rolling game. So to do that, let's start with a, a simple example here and just sort of work up from there. So let's say we want to compute just the utility of being in this state. So this is a state where we have a two showing on the die and we have two turns left here in the game. Okay, and so we want to know what is the utility of being in st the state where a two is showing on the face of the die and we have two turns left. That's what we're after here. So we just want to compute the utility of being in this state. And so to do that, we have to sort of look at the subtree that is built from this state, okay? And because the utility look ahead function here is this recursive function, we're going to sort of start at the, the bottom of the tree and then build up from there, okay? So to actually compute that utility, we need to first go to the bottom of the tree here and look at this sort of last turn that we could be in, okay? So that's where we're going to start uh, this problem from. Okay, so we simply want to compute the utility of being in this state, which is a two showing on the die with one turn left, right? What is the utility for this state? 
So we're going to look at the look ahead equation here. So the utility here of being in this particular state is going to be the max over actions. In this case, we have two actions, keep or roll. We're going to get the immediate reward for taking that action plus the discount factor. And here we're assuming that the discount factor gamma is equal to 0 0.9. Okay. We're going to look at all of the possible states we could transition to the probability of transitioning into those states multiplied by the utility of being in that next state that we transition to. Okay, that's this look ahead equation that we have here. So what this comes out to for this particular state, recall, we're in a state where is two is on the die and we have one turn left. And we know what we saw before, right, our intuition says we should always be keeping the die in this state. So what this looks like here is we're going to take the max over actions. And then looking at the first component of this max here, that's evaluating the keep action. Okay, so we get immediate reward of $2, right? That's where the two is coming from. Immediate reward of $2 for keeping the die plus the discount factor times the state that we would transition to next. Well, this is the end of the game. So we're gonna just get zero reward after that because the game is over. So there's no more reward to be computed after that. So it's just two plus gamma times zero since there's no more states that we could end up in. Now, if instead looking at the right side of this max, if we had instead taken the roll action, we know that we're going to receive an immediate reward of zero because we're deciding to roll. And then the future reward that we're gonna be getting is also zero, okay? So the utility here is gonna come out to two because we're just taking the max over actions here and the max over actions would be the keep action, which is gonna return a value of two. Putting this back into our tree now, we've seen that the utility for being in a state where two is on the face of the die with one turn left, the utility of that particular state is two. Now, if we wanna look at the other uh, states at this sort of base level here for this particular example that we're looking at, those are just similarly going to be the value on the face of the die, right? So for being in, an, in a state where a one is on the face of the die with one turn left, the utility there is one because the payout will be one. Similarly, for two and three, we can sort of extend that same reasoning to there. Okay, so now we want to get back to our original goal here, right, which was what is the utility of being in a state where a two is showing on the face of the die with two turns left? That's what we were originally after. So now that we have these sort of sub utilities for these follow on states, we can go back and now we can compute the utility for being in that particular state that we were interested in. Okay, so working this out here now, we see, again, we're taking the max over actions. So first looking at the keep action. Again, we get an immediate reward of two because we decided to take the keep action with a two on the die. So we get a payout of two right away. And then plus gamma times the sum over all of the states we could transition to. Well, we know we can only transition to a state where a two is on the die because we took the keep action. So we're only going to be able to transition to that state. So we just have gamma times the utility of being in that next state, right? Which is two, we already computed that. That's the left side of this max, which is taking the keep action from that state. Now, if we instead take the roll action, what does that look like? The immediate reward we receive for taking the roll action is zero. So that's where that zero comes from on the right side here, plus gamma times a third. So where does this one third factor come from? Well, remember, we're looking at the probability that we transition to that follow on state because we're rolling a three sided die. We have equal probability of ending up in the state with a one, two or three on the die. OK, so that's where this one third comes from. That's the transition probability into each one of those states. Now, we've sort of factored this out here and then we've just written the utility of being in each one of those states, right? Because this is a summation in this right hand term here. Okay, so we just sum over the utility of being in each one of those states, so one, two, or three, and then we take that sum multiplied by gamma times one third. And so what this comes out to now is that the utility here is going to be equal to 3.8. Recall that our discount factor is equal to 0 0.9, so the 3.8 here is coming from that keep action. Okay, so the optimal thing to do when you're in a state where a two is showing on the die with two turns left, you should take the keep action. Okay, so we can now put this back into our tree here and we come up with 3.8.
Now, if we were to repeat this process here for all of those other sub branches, what it would look like is we would end up with these utility estimates. And so from this, what you can see is that the optimal sequence of actions here in this particular setup with a discount factor equal to 0 0.9, the optimal thing to do is to first, when you start in a state, where one is on the die and you have three turns left, you should first roll the die and then you should keep the die no matter what after that. Okay, so in that first roll, you're going to re-roll and then from there, you're gonna take keep and keep and those are the optimal sequence of actions here in this example. So now if we want to actually look at the code here of how we would set up the forward search algorithm, we're gonna be using uh, Julia here to do this. So first it involves building the Markov decision process struct here in Julia. And so recall that uh, MDP is defined by the following components. We have the discount factor here, the state space, action space, transition function, reward function, and then this TR function allows us to sample from the transition and reward as we're building up the tree here. Okay, so that's our, that's our basic problem definition here of what we're gonna be working with. Then we need another struct, which represents the forward search algorithm itself here. So that's going to be taking in the problem here is just an instantiation of a Markov decision process struct. Then the depth that we're going to be building this tree to, and then u, which is the value function estimate at depth d. Okay, so when we get to the base of that tree, what are we returning as the value function estimate? And we'll talk about that more as we build up the algorithm here. Okay, and then the last thing that we need before we get into it is just this look ahead implementation. So you can see look ahead takes a problem here, which is of type MDP. That's what that colon colon MDP means is just specifying the type of the variable that's being passed in. It takes that utility estimate, the specific state we're looking at, the specific action we're looking at. Okay, that first line is just sort of extracting the state transition reward and discount factor. And then we're going to return just the look ahead function here that we've seen before, right? So all of this is doing is just implementing this equation here into the Julia code that we've built up so far. Okay, so that's all we're doing in the look ahead function. And now we're ready for the actual forward search algorithm here. So what this looks like now is we're going to have this function here, forward search, which again takes in the problem, it takes in the state, the depth, and the utility estimate. So this is going to be a recursive function. And so in order to build up this recursive function, we need a base case here, okay? So this base case is if the depth here is less than or equal to zero, we're going to return the action as well as the value estimate, okay? So the action here at depth zero is gonna be nothing, right? Because we're not going any further than this uh, depth of the search tree, okay? And then we're also going to return the value estimate, which is that value function at depth D that we put in that forward search struct. Okay, so now that we have our, our base case set up, we're then going to initialize the following. Okay, so we say the best action value pair that we've seen so far, we're gonna initialize that to nothing and then the value to negative infinity, right? Because we're expecting that we'll be improving on this. Then here we have this U prime of S is equal to forward search Right, so this is where the recursive part is coming in. Now keep in mind in Julia, this is not actually calling the function yet, okay? This is just defining the U prime of S function. It's not actually calling it yet though. Okay, so we're just setting up the definition of this U prime of S. And you can see that, we, that we're going to be passing in D minus one here. So that's sort of where this recursion is happening, but we're not calling the function yet. So now we're going to look over all of the actions in the action space. And so for each one of those actions, we're now going to call the look ahead function. Okay, so we're gonna go into this look ahead function here. And now we're calling that look ahead function with that U prime as our utility function in this look ahead. Okay, so that U prime now comes in here and recall we define the U prime as forward search. So inside the look ahead function here, as we're summing over all of the states in the state space for that particular action that we've passed in, that's when we're actually gonna go back in and call forward search now with a depth that's been incremented down by one. Okay, so we would go back into forward search. We would then sort of just repeat this process here of continuing on until we reach the base case 
of d less than or equal to zero, which we will then return that base case of nothing and the utility estimate at that root. So now let's talk about this utility estimate here. Where we would essentially be at when we've reached this base case, right, is we've gone down the search tree. And since this is a depth first search here, we've sort of hit the base now of the tree. And we could, one choice here is to just return u of s equal to zero. This would be in the case where you're only concerned about planning up to that specific depth or horizon. You don't care about planning beyond that horizon. Okay, so you could return just a utility estimate of zero, sort of like in our dice example that we saw. Now, you could alternatively instead return some other approximate value function here. Okay, so if you have some maybe offline learn value function or some heuristic value function that you want to include here, that's where you could return that estimate. And this would be in a case where you actually are concerned with planning beyond that depth, but maybe just for computation reasons, you've limited the depth of your tree. Okay, so this is where that utility function estimate comes in and where you have the ability to sort of change what you're doing here, depending on the problem that you're working with. Okay, so that's where it's returned is in that base case when you've hit sort of the bottom of the tree here. Okay, and so you're going to continue in that sort of recursion there as you return those look ahead estimates. After you've sort of returned that for one particular state and action pair, right, you're then going to look at, okay, is this utility greater than the best that I've seen so far? If it's greater than the best that you've seen so far, you're going to update the best you've seen so far and continue on in this action loop recursively. Okay, so then at the end, once you've iterated over all of the actions for all of the depths in this tree, you're going to return the best that you've seen. And then at the end, you can construct a policy here, okay, where this pi colon colon forward search, what that is saying is this is indicating that pi is expected to be of type forward search, right? And so this is just a type annotation, again, that tells Julia the kind of object that pi must be. And so this syntax here allows an object of type forward search to be called as a function with the input argument s. And so it, it's effectively overloading here the call operator so that when you call pi of s, it will execute this defined function here. Okay, and so remember that our policy pi maps states to actions. So this is allowing us to sort of call it in this way of pi of s here would then execute the forward search algorithm and return the best action. Okay, so that is all of the code that we would need to set up the forward search algorithm in Julia. Next, we're going to be looking at branch and bound here. Okay, and so remember that branch and bound is really focused on trying to avoid the exponential complexity by reasoning about bounds on the value function. And so this requires knowing a lower bound on the utility function and an upper bound on the action value function or the Q function. And so with these bounds on the, on the two functions here, we're able to prune parts of the search tree. And so pruning is going to occur if the upper bound of an action at a state is lower than the lower bound of a previously explored action from that state. And I think when you see it just written out like that, you're like, I have no idea what this is saying or why that would make any sense. So I think that's where it sort of helps to see the example. And then we'll come back to that statement and it will make uh, more sense after you've seen the example. Okay, so here's the whole forward search tree, right? If we built up using that same previous example. Now, the, perhaps we first explored the left side of the tree. Okay, so we've already done our forward search here on the left side of the tree, and we've gotten some best utility estimate here using that lower bound value function estimate. Okay, so we use the lower bound here at the base of the tree to sort of propagate up the utility. And so we've already explored the left side, and now we're going over to the right side and we're saying, okay, looking at this action now, I now am going to query my upper bound on the Q function here. So I'm going to look at the upper bound on the Q function from this initial state and this action, and I'm going to look at, is this upper bound less than the best utility that I've seen so far from that left side of the tree? Okay, so notice what this is saying. This is saying the upper bound is telling me the best possible that I could ever hope to achieve from this state taking this action, right? That's why it's an upper bound. So this is the best possible I could ever hope to achieve. If that best possible is less than the best that I've already seen so far on the other side of the search tree, there is no reason to explore the rest of this tree because we know for sure we're not going to be able to outperform what we've already seen on the left side. So let's just save ourselves the time and not explore that side of the tree. 
That's how branch and bound works. And that's what that statement was saying is that we're using these upper and lower bounds to be able to make this pruning decision if it's the case that the upper bound on the Q function is less than the best utility that we've seen so far. Okay, so that's what this is saying. So now connecting this back to our die example here, let's say that we have the following upper and lower bounds. Okay, so our lower bound here estimate is just going to be the utility at a particular state is just zero, right? We're saying that's our lower bound, which is a pretty reasonable lower bound here. And it's, it's kind of a conservative estimate. We're going to say now that the upper bound here on the Q function from the initial state, taking the keep action is three and taking the roll action is four. Okay. So this, where do these come from, right? Where do these upper and lower bounds come from? Well, as you can kind of see, it requires having some knowledge about the reward function that you're going to be working with or the domain that you're operating in, right? So typically for these game-based environments, you can come up with pretty reasonable estimates of your upper and lower bounds. And this is a very simple game here. In more complicated real-world settings where you don't even really know your reward function that well or you've had to estimate it from data, this might be a lot more challenging to actually come up with these valid upper and lower bound estimates and be certain that they are actual upper and lower bounds on the true function that you're interested in. Okay, so that's just sort of a disclaimer here on branch and bound. But given in this example, right, that we have these upper and lower bounds, what this is going to look like here is that the way branch and bound works is that first you start by ordering the actions according to their upper bound. Okay, so you're going to sort them in decreasing order by upper bound. So what this means is we're going to have to reorder the search tree here and we're actually going to be looking at the role action first since it has a higher upper bound. So that's sort of the first step of the branch and bound algorithm. Now, we've already sort of gone through this example of computing the utilities here. So we're first going to explore the role action right on the left. And what that's going to come out to using the utilities that we found previously is that we're going to have this utility of taking the role action here from the initial state is equivalent to 3.42. Okay, and that just comes out from the discount factor again here is 0.9. So this is the utility now that we've seen by exploring the left side of the, ser the search tree, right? And we already did that in the forward search example. So now we're going to come over here as we explore the other side of the tree. And so we've stored our, our best utility that we've seen so far. And now we're looking at taking the keep action from this initial state. And we know that our upper bound here on the keep action is three. So now we're going to ask ourselves, is our upper bound estimate, right? The best possible that we could ever hope to achieve is that less than the best that we've already seen so far? Well, in this case, yes, it is less than the best we've already seen so far. So we don't have to explore this keep action any further. We can just stop right there because we satisfied that condition, okay? And so that's really the power of the branch and bound algorithm is that if you have these good upper and lower bound estimates, you can often save yourself quite a bit of search time by not having to explore parts of the search tree that you know are not that promising. Okay, that's really the, the goal of branch and bound here. And so now if we want to look at the code here that would be used to uh, build up branch and bound, it's going to be similar in that we're setting up the Markov decision process just like before. And now the branch and bound struct here is just going to take the problem, the depth, and now we have these upper and lower bound estimates on the value function and the action value function. And then we have the look ahead equation just like before. So how the branch and bound algorithm is going to work here is that we're taking in the problem, the state, the depth, and then those upper and lower bound estimates. The base case here is going to be very similar to before, but notice here, now we are returning the lower bound estimate at that base of the search tree. Okay, the reason that we're using this lower bound is because in order to make pruning decisions, right? We need to be able to say, well, the utility estimate, the best utility estimate was a lower bound estimate. And that's how we can compare this to the upper bound and then prune from there. Okay, so that's, that's the important thing to notice here is that we're returning the lower bound estimate at the base of the search tree. Now, very similar to before here, we are just defining this u prime utility function, we're not actually calling it yet. But again, we have this same recursive structure here of calling branch and bound. And then we're going to initialize the best that we've seen so far to nothing and negative infinity. 
Okay, and so now we are going to loop over the actions here, but recall in branch and bound, we first have to sort by the upper bound. Okay, so that's what this is doing here. In this line, we are sorting the actions in the action space and we're sorting them, this is the Julia syntax here, by the upper bound estimate. Okay, so this is taking the actions here, passing it into that upper bound estimate. We're sorting it by that upper bound estimate. Okay, and then the reverse equal to true means here that we're just sorting them in decreasing order. So we're gonna have the greatest upper bound estimate, the action according to that first is how this is gonna work. Okay, so now that we've sorted it, we're then going to check that pruning condition, right? So is our upper bound estimate is the best possible we could ever hope to achieve less than the best that we've already seen so far? If it is, then that means it's safe to prune here, right? And that's just, this is just that example that we saw before of checking here on this side, is this in fact the case? And if it is, then we can just remove that part of the search tree. So that's all there is to it. The rest is just going to proceed exactly the same as forward search did. And then at the end, very similarly, we can call this policy here on any given state and that will execute the branch and bound algorithm and then return us the action to take from that particular state. So that wraps us up on branch and bound and forward search. I hope that was useful and I hope the code was able to connect back and give you that intuition here with the example as well.